Hi guys, welcome back to Wilderbeard Reviews and welcome to a new series here on the channel, a new review series where we are going to be taking a look back at Grant Morrison's run on X-Men or new X-Men from or starting in 2000 run one running for about 40 issues. Now before we get into issue one, I want to do a little bit of housekeeping on what I hope this series is going to look like and uh, the posting schedule and things like that. So like I said, there's 40 issues in this particular run from Grant Morrison, I would like to post a video every day for the next 40 days, or at least the next 39 days, since we're on day one now that you guys are watching this. Um, I reserve the right to change that plan at any point in time. Um, my fear is that 40 videos is going to be a little bit too much, and maybe not every issue would need its own video to delve into, so we might combine a couple issues here and there just depending on what's going into them. Um, I believe I've actually read all of these 40 issues before, but it is been so long for the most part it's as if I'm rereading them again for the first time so that's pretty cool so um, we'll see how it plays out I would like to like I said do at least a video a day maybe not each video will be one specific um, issue maybe it'll be two or three issues just depending on how things play out um, and if I have to skip a day here and there just because life gets in the way then that's what we'll do so uh, about the series itself what I want to do now that we're going back through this older series um, and we have have the, the whole thing available to us. I got all 40 issues sitting over here in a box. Um, so what I want to do with this is look at the themes of this thing, um, kind of similar to how I've been um, thinking through the, the the Dawn of Vex titles and Jonathan Hickman's run. Um, I, I always kind of take each new issue from any of the Dawn of X series and take a look and analyze and think about how and critique it based on how it affects the main themes and the main story plots set up in House of X and Powers of Ten. And so what I want to do here with issue one is talk about some of the themes that Grant Morrison sets up and then and some of the character plots that Grant Morrison sets up and then look at subsequent issues and see how what he what how those other issues stack up and how they add to and build upon the themes that are set forth in here. Also something else I want to keep an eye on um, is the timing of this series from back in the day. So I said this is July 2001. That's just about a year after the first X-Men movie hit theaters, and so I want to see if there's any indications of how that place in time of where X-Men was in the cultural zeitgeist within a pop culture affected this particular series. I think we can already pick up on a couple things because of um, their uh, uh, costuming here. Obviously, they're a little bit more comic booky than they were in the movie, but you can already tell um, they're toned down. They're not as, you know, uh, yellow spandexy as uh, Wolverine or, or uh, Cyclops has that line um, in the movie. So that's something that I want to keep a, a lookout for. So, um, with all that out of the way, let's go ahead and dive into New X-Men issue 114, written by Grant Morrison, with art by Frank Quitely. A fantastic first issue, and what, um, what I feel like is kind of a good level set for um, for maybe new readers coming into, uh, coming into the world of X-Men. We'll talk about that, one of those themes that I was thinking about um, as we go through it. So, um, right out of the gate, we get a great picture here of Wolverine and Cyclops whooping ass on a sentinel as you can see there in uh, Australia, Sydney, Australia there with the opera house in the in the background. I love Cyclops here. He says, Wolverine, you can probably stop doing that. Now, is there a, a better one single picture that um, portrays both of these um, two characters? Love that. Right out of the gate, just dropping that on us with that amazing uh, Frank Quietly art. Now, here on our next page, it says uh, 30,000 years earlier, and it's really, it ends up being a, a virtual reality um, uh, type thing that we got going on here, but we get our first introduction to our main villain for, or one of our main villains for this run in Cassandra Nova, and that is uh, the woman here in the, the safari outfit. And so they are, um, she's there with this person who we find out is uh, not Bolivar Trask, but someone related to Bolivar Trask. Um, on this page, she just refers to him as Mr. Trask, and they're there looking at um, some, uh, looking at Neanderthals and um, or Neanderthal Lannis, I believe is how you pronounce that, um, attacking each other. And she um, says here, um, Homo sapiens Neanderthalus, the last unlucky remnants of their kind, uh, soon to be replaced by a smarter, faster, more aggressive species, Homo sapiens sapiens. Meet our 
ancestors wiping out the competition. And then in this panel right here, she says, science calls them homo sapiens superior, the mutants. You saw my findings. The human race will be just as extinct as Neanderthal uh, man within four generations unless we fight back before it's too late. So already we have some of our classic X-Men themes here. We have um, humans being f fearful that homo sapiens superior mutants will supplant them. And this, um, she said, her saying here, um, within four generations, I believe there was some line uh, that felt very similar to that over in uh, Jonathan Hickman's uh, X-Men like we talked about um, where they were saying you know within a few generations Homo sapiens superior would completely supplant uh, just Homo sapiens just humans so we're already having setting up that um, that fight between humans and mutants a classic core X-Men and so one of the things that I think this book really does well is kind of shoves to center shoves back to the core of what makes the X-Men X-Men you know they are mutants are different from humans they are that next step of human evolution in the Marvel Universe, and there's obviously that friction there. Humans realize what mutants are, mutants realize what they are, and there's that um, uh, friction between them. So we'll see how um, that continues to play out. And I love that um, the, this Trask says here that he's only a dentist, so right off we're like, why is, uh, why is Cassandra got um, uh, an old, uh, just a dentist here? So we had a great credits page here um, with our main crew of X-Men, Cyclops, Jean Grey, Emma Frost, Beast, Logan, and um, uh, Xavier there. So we actually don't get to see Emma Frost in this one despite her being here on this page and on the cover. I assume she'll show up in the next issue or two. But I do like that, again, shoving to the core of who the X-Men are, uh, are, especially coming out of the, the wake of that first X-Men movie, um, aside from Emma and Beast, um, you got Cyclops, you got Jean, you got Wolverine and Xavier, some of the key characters from the movie. So if a fan of that movie was walking into their comic shop saying, hey, I really like that X-Men movie and maybe we're talking about X-Men 2 uh, coming along. Um, do you have a book that I can read? And a comic shop owner uh, or a worker could hand them this and be like, look, this is a great place to start. Um, you got characters you're familiar with. You got um, a classic character in Beast and maybe a new character um, you can get to know in Emma Frost. So I really like um, the cast past that Morrison picked for himself here. All right, got a nice little uh, two-page advertisement here. I love these uh, old advertisements here. Uh, Mile High Comics still alive and kicking. It's been a while since I've ordered um, anything from them. All right, then we go here to the uh, Xavier Mansion where they are putting together a new Cerebro called Cerebra. All right, so we get an idea of the power of this thing where Xavier says, um, if Cerebro works, she'll amplify my psychic senses to the 10th power. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to experiencing that. I guess we all would if we had psychic powers or any kind of powers and we got a, uh, a 10x boost on them. That would be fantastic. We get a little bit more um, uh, explanation as to what this is, and they say, uh, uh, Imagine Cerebro's big sister. She can boost the professor's mutant locating abilities to a global range. Uh, humor me, Gene. I'm hormonally uh, imbalanced, and that's... Um, a, a, Beast talking here. One of the other tenants of Grant Morrison's run are secondary mutations, so I believe this is where we get um, both Beast looking more cat-like than he usually does, and also um, uh, Emma Frost being able to turn to her diamond skin. Um, and so again, locating mutants, that's something we saw very clearly in the first X-Men movie. So again, giving those, uh, maybe those new readers, those classic touchstones that they're familiar with from the movies, wanting to uh, be able to jump into the comics pretty cleanly and give them a nice entry point to the comics. All right, and then we turn the page and we get another familiar sight here with Xavier using Cerebra to look around for all the mutants. Again, like I said, just said another touchstone to um, the, the movie that maybe uh, new readers would be familiar with, but we see this spike right here in South America, and Beast catches up on it. She's like, "What?" He's like, "Wait, what's that? You, what's that big one? Use the zoom. I just saw this enormous spike in South America." And so they're um, trying to take a look at it, but 
it disappears, he says. I missed it. There's something around Colombia, Ecuador, perhaps. I thought I felt a trace, but enhanced uh, X 200%. And so they're asking, and then they plan to ask uh, Wolverine and Logan or, and, and Cyclops to take a look at it. And so we go to them in the jet where they're going to uh, go and take a look at it. And they've got uh, this mutant here. Um, his name is Steve, but his friends always call him Ugly John. I don't know if I can get, if my camera can uh, shows that clearly enough, but he's kind of got a, like a tri-face thing uh, going on here. And uh, Wolverine is still literally smoking, not smoking a cigarette or cigar, but his body is um, still smoking as his body is still kind of on fire and smoldering from uh, from the fight that they had as he heals himself. Very, very classic um, Wolverine stuff there. Let me get a mention of the Sentinels here where um, Cyclops says, let's hope that the ones we just fought were some of the last Sentinels we'll ever see. They look like decommissioned government ordnance, rogue machines left over from the big mutant witch hunts a few months back. Uh, I've read through the rest of this issue and they are not the last Sentinels we're going to see. Of course not because Sentinels are a... Uh, classic touchstone in uh classic villain in uh x-men lore they never go anywhere right so their uh, their passenger there um, passes out, and so uh, Xavier is calling them into a, a psychic conference, and then we go back to Cassandra Nova, where they um, her and the the dentist Trask, uh, the dentist in the Trask family, takes off his helmet and barfs into it after they've gone through their uh, look back to thirty thousand years in the past, and she says here. Um, uh, your Uncle Bolivar built the first of the old Sentinels, is that right? The Philadelphia Trask, controversial uh, creators of android weapons, systems designed to terminate and exterminate mutant X gene carriers. They look wonderful, I admit. Classic designs, oh, yes, they are classic designs, but Sentinels have always been spectacularly ineffective against highly adaptive homo superior targets. Did you know your tax dollars helped... Uh, uh, fund a Shadow Sentinel program, Mr. Task. No, you didn't. No one did. It makes me wonder what my tax dollars are going to these days. And they are in that South American jungle, and they come across a master mold. That is, I'm going to guess, uh, be a very key point um, going forward here. All right, so we go to um, the the psychic uh, kind of meeting there with all of the X-Men, and Xavier's kind of setting the stage here for us a little bit. He says, a new generation of mutants is emerging. That much is certain. They will be called freaks, genetic monstrosities. They will be mocked, feared, spat upon, and accused of stealing jobs, eating human, stealing human jobs, eating human food, taking human partners, but they are emerging in inner cities and suburbs and deserts and jungles. So again, kind of a classic thing that the X-Men are doing wanting to go find those new mutants <laughs> new mutants those newly developed mutants and pull them to the school and give them that home teach them how to use their powers and that's kind of what he um goes into here uh xavier continues on i've been working uh, on better ways to encourage people to trust mutants again always that trust between humans and mutants Good, good, classic, classic X-Men stuff. So they uh, go out of the um, the psychic uh, meeting there, and then uh, and back in the X-Jet, or the X-Wing, I think they call it, that might be a little bit of copyright infringement, um, Wolverine kind of gives Cyclops a bit of grief and says, hey, um... Uh, something's going on there. Like you couldn't wait to get out of his head. And Cyclops says, "Like, are you insinuating something?" He and Wolverine says, "I don't insinuate. I call it like I see it." Um, and then kind of nugs him. And then finally, Scott says, "Gene and I are perfectly happy, Logan." Which I highly doubt. You don't say someone. You don't say it like that if you are truly um, perfectly happy. We get a uh, cool scene here with. Um, with Gene and Beast in his lab, where he's got this cool holographic projector thing, looking very much like uh, Iron Man in the early days of the uh, the MCU, and I think she also um, mentions here that her and Scott are perfectly happy. Which again, both of them saying it at the same time, it probably means they are are not happy. All right, then we got Xavier back in Cerebra, and this is where things get a little hairy for uh, for Professor here. Someone 
calls into his mind and basically takes over and says, Hello, Charles. The mind amplifier works like a dream, doesn't it? It led me right to where you are. What a special big new toy for a crippled little boy. It's almost like being able to get up and about, isn't it? And she just like mind bombs him. Mind bombs him. He can't even form a single thought. Uh, she says, I am eating. I am what's eating your mind. Relax and be replaced. I'll be you now and make you a murderer, Charles. Um, the, the first, the oldest, and the last enemy. The terror and hate you thought you would, ne would never return. Charlie's big, ugly secret. The nightmare on the dark side of your dream. Surrender, Charles. And then he pulls out a gun from somewhere. Never thought Charles would be the one to, to have his concealed carry license, but he pulls it out and says, I'll only say this, uh, I'll say this only once. If I can turn the page. Um, get out of my head or I'll fire. And then she says, you would too, wouldn't you? Well, it's only now, uh, this is only how it starts. You're very afraid now. And that's where uh, Jean comes in and breaks him, uh, or and, uh, takes the, the helmet off him. So we know Cassandra Nova is a big, bad person. If she can do this to Charles Xavier, gets him to the point where almost immediately he's willing to blow his head off just to make sure his power doesn't fall into her hand. So we have a great level set on how how big and bad our our villain is here all right so we go back to the jungle where um, we find out why our big bad person brought the the dentist from the trask family tree into the jungle with him and that's because these new sentinels that have been using the technology all around them to rebuild themselves recognize him as a trask and will obey him they say uh preserve trask dna preserve trask dna so they don't attack and this is what is giving um cassandra nova her weapons for the m pending fight so great villain introduction we kind of get a good level set on who our heroes are and where they are in this one with um kind of shoving to the center of the core of the x-men those major tenants of the x-men and what they do bringing students to uh, the the school to help them uh, understand their new powers and protect them from the fear and uh, hate of the the humans great great stuff so that is a uh, new x-men issue 114 e is for extinction part one so guys what did you think about this issue where do you think we're going with this or if you remember this one uh buying this one off the rack what is your recollection of this one were there some details that you didn't remember um all that good stuff leave all that down in the comments down below for me thank you guys so much for watching if it's your first time here at the channel thank you so much for watching be sure to click that subscribe button before you click away and until next time we'll see you at the comic shop